This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. Sponsored by Amazon, Audible, HostGator, Gamefly, and supporters of independent media like you. Welcome to the Humanist Report. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 38th episode of the podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by our latest member on humanistreport.com. Today we have Charles in solo. Thank you so much for joining, buddy. If any of you would like to be a member on humanistreport.com or on Patreon, you can visit the links in the description box. On today's episode, I will be discussing the CNN Democratic debate. I'll also be talking about Bernie Sanders' spat with Verizon CEO and his perfect response. And then also, I'll be addressing Hillary Clinton's hypocrisy when it comes to campaign contributions and how she actually criticized Barack Obama in 2008 for doing exactly what she's doing today. More details on that later. Also, I'll talk about Bernie Sanders' endorsement from Senator Jeff Merkley, as well as the attacks Bernie Sanders received from one journalist because, get this, his crowds are too large. So I am excited to talk about that. Additionally, Bernie Sanders released his 2014 tax return, and to no one's surprise, they're boring, but nonetheless, we're going to talk about it. Also, Bill Clinton demonizes Bernie Sanders supporters again, and the RNC chair, Rance Priebus, discusses who he'd rather run against in November. All of these topics will be addressed. Uh, stay tuned. I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Recently in New York, Bernie Sanders joined Verizon workers in the picket line to help protest with them once negotiations between their union and the company broke down. Now, while Hillary Clinton just went for a photo op with Verizon workers, Bernie Sanders actually picketed with them and was standing right beside them as they fought for justice. Now, because of this, Bernie Sanders garnered criticism from Verizon's greedy CEO, Lowell McAdam. And the nation explains in a statement headlined, Feeling the Burn of Reality, the facts about Verizon and the moral economy, the CEO decried the senator as uninformed and claimed that Sanders' pro-labor stance oversimplifies the complex forces operating in today's technologically advanced and hyper-competitive economy. The assault on Sanders by McAdam was similar to an attack on the senator by General Electric CEO Jeffrey Immelt, who objected to a recent suggestion by the senator that the greed of corporations such as GE, which have shipped thousands of jobs overseas, is undermining the middle class and destroying the moral fabric of the United States. Now they continue, after Verizon's McAdam decry the senator's pro-union rhetoric as contemptible, Sanders tweeted, I don't want the support of McAdam, Immelt, and their friends in the billionaire class. I welcome their contempt. Now, if you take the words that Bernie Sanders used here, I welcome their contempt, and you compare this to a speech that FDR gave in 1936, you'll see the similarities between Bernie Sanders and FDR. Business and financial monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, class antagonism, sectionalism, war profiteering. They had begun to consider the government of the United States as a mere appendage to their own affairs. And we know now that government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by organized mob. <laughs> Never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today? They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. Now, let's contrast this with Bernie Sanders' rhetoric. I think that the greed of Wall Street in corporate America is destroying this economy and impacting negatively the lives of tens of millions of people. You have to take them on at the debate. I don't know if any of you saw the debate the other night. Somebody asked, you know, Hillary Clinton, uh, there was apparently a front page story someplace about how corporate America likes Hillary Clinton, whatever it was, and, and does she want to be liked by them? And she said, I want to be liked by everybody. I do not want to be liked by everybody. <laughs> Thank you. 
I want to be liked and supported by the middle class and working families because I am going to take on Wall Street and the billionaire class. They do not like me today. They will like me even less if I'm elected for president. But I welcome their dislike. So in the end, you know that Bernie Sanders means business. Rhetoric is rhetoric, right? So words are one thing, but Bernie Sanders has the progressive record to prove that he will put actions to his words. He's right there with the Verizon workers, picketing with them. Hillary Clinton does not care about the workers. She may pay them lip service, but Bernie Sanders has been there all along. And the problem is that Verizon workers, much like many other workers, are exploited. They're being taken advantage of. So while the greedy CEO of Verizon, Lowell McAdam, makes millions upon millions each year, well, his workers aren't even given a living wage. And that is something that's egregious. His greed, like Bernie Sanders stated, is destroying the country. It's destroying the middle class. And once the middle class broke down, and once the middle class breaks down, and you just have really, really, really rich people and really, really, really poor people, that is an economic situation that is not sustainable. That's a bubble that's going to pop. You cannot have income inequality get that bad and not have severe economic consequences. Many economists have stated this. Don't take my word for it. And it's something that's really, really scary. If we don't actually rebuild the middle class, this isn't just going to be bad for middle class and poor people. This will be bad for rich people as well. They don't realize this, that if they collapse the economy, guess who's not going to have money to buy their products that they produce? Poor people. So not only are these individuals greedy, they're just dim-witted as well. They don't understand fully how the economy works. If you increase the purchasing power of citizens, guess what happens? Well, logically, they have more money to spend at businesses, and then those businesses have more money to create jobs and expand. And that's the way that the economy gets turning. This is elementary economics, but nobody can understand it who's at the top because they're so greedy, they're so consumed with greed, that facts and reality, they have no bearing in their company. So Bernie Sanders' rhetoric here and calling out these CEOs and his response, it's brilliant and it's just one of many reasons why he is the candidate that we not just should elect, but have to elect if we actually want to save our economy and the middle class. For weeks now, Hillary Clinton and her supporters have pretended to be outraged at the fact that Bernie Sanders has yet to release all of his tax returns. Meanwhile, it's now been 71 days, 37 minutes, and 38 seconds since Hillary Clinton told us she would look into it when asked if she would release the transcripts of paid speeches she gave to Goldman Sachs. Are you willing to release the transcripts of all your paid speeches? We do know through reporting that there were transcription services for all of those paid speeches. In, the, in full disclosure, would you release all of them? I will look into it. I don't know the status, but I will certainly look into it. So obviously, this is a blatant attempt to make it appear as though Bernie Sanders has something to hide in order to divert attention away from the fact that Hillary Clinton has not released her paid speech transcripts. Now look, I've always maintained that Bernie Sanders should release his tax returns, of course, because one, I think that you should just be more transparent, and two, if he doesn't, then the Hillary Clinton campaign and, uh, and her supporters will just continue to use it against him. So I think it's practical to release his tax returns. And today, he actually did release his 2014 return, and as promised, it's pretty boring. There's nothing shocking or even mildly interesting in there. Now, he does plan to release the rest of his tax returns, but since there's nothing interesting in his 2014 return, we can expect the same thing to be true for the rest of his returns. Now, even though there's nothing in it, we're going to dig in. So Politico explains that Bernie Sanders paid $27,653 in federal taxes on adjusted gross income of $205,000 and the majority of Sanders' earnings came from his 174000 salary as a U.S. senator, as well as Social Security benefits. The returns, filed jointly with his wife, Jane, were just as boring and straightforward as Sanders repeatedly said they would be, particularly compared to those of Hillary Clinton, his multi-millionaire opponent for the nomination. And that's it. <laughs> Now, the thing that I love is that this whole ordeal turned out to be more embarrassing for Hillary Clinton than Bernie Sanders because in releasing his tax returns, she drew attention to the fact that Bernie Sanders makes less in a year than she makes in one hour giving paid speeches to Goldman Sachs. And furthermore, it shows that she makes roughly 137 times more than Bernie Sanders each year. 
she should never have brought this up because it just shows how far removed she is from ordinary people and how closer Bernie Sanders is to the average citizen. So I am actually glad in the end that this came out and that they're making a huge commotion about this because all it does is show Hillary Clinton's flaws and show that Bernie Sanders is very, very normal. So now how about this? Since Bernie Sanders went out of his way to release one of his tax returns, how about you go tit for tat? So every time he releases a tax return, you release one of your paid speech transcripts, the Golden Sachs, Hillary. Hmm? You don't have to release all of them, just one maybe? Any one of your choosing? No? <laughs> That's right, because uh, you can't call him out on that, and you shouldn't have called him out on this in the first place because you're a hypocrite. You can't claim to be transparent and call someone else out for their lack of transparency if you've hidden so much, if you refuse to release something that I think is really important for us voters to see. So I love that this uh, tax return scandal happened now because it just shows that Bernie Sanders is coming out on top, much like all of the attacks waged against him by Hillary Clinton and her supporters because it just makes him more popular. It just ends up exposing Hillary Clinton more than Bernie Sanders. So this is something that I'm really excited about and I'm glad that you know this became a big issue because um, <laughs> it's helping Bernie, so keep it up, guys. Uh, but yeah, Bernie Sanders, uh, hopefully he releases the rest of them soon, so that way this whole issue can be put to rest, but I'm not going to sweat it now, because not that I, I, I was, you know, doubting him in the first place, but I just, you know, this shows what he's been saying all along. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along. Trevor Tim of The Guardian penned an article that shows how Hillary Clinton is a hypocrite on the issue of money in politics and it also serves as a harsh reality check for Hillary Clinton supporters. Now effectively what the Democratic Party and many Hillary Clinton supporters have done is they've done a 180 when it comes to money in politics. They critique Mitt Romney and the Republicans for taking large sums of money from special interests and they say that it influences them but now all of a sudden it's okay if Hillary Clinton does that, and it doesn't influence her. Well, Tim broke it down in a phenomenal way. So he explains that Democrats have a decision to make. Do they think money in politics is a corrupting force that influences the decisions made by elected officials or not? After years of railing against the Citizens United decision, which opened the floodgates to outside spending in elections, some of them appear to have done a complete reversal. The Clinton campaign has spent the last few weeks furiously pushing back at the criticism that she is influenced by the vast donations her campaign receives from backers in the oil and financial industries. Now, the irony he points out is that Clinton harshly criticized then-Senator Obama for accepting donations from oil and gas executives and even cut a campaign commercial about it. The kicker? It was less money than Clinton has accepted from people working for fossil fuel companies so far this campaign season. While Clinton called the suggestion that she might be influenced by the wealthy bankers who raised money for her campaign in Artful Smear in 2016, she also had no problem hurling even stronger accusations about Obama in 2008, saying Senator Obama has some questions to answer about his dealings with one of the largest contributors, Exelon, a big nuclear power company, she said. Apparently, he cut some deals behind closed doors to protect them from full disclosure of the nuclear industry. Now, this clearly demonstrates that Hillary Clinton is a hypocrite because we all know that she takes money from Goldman Sachs. They pay her $225,000 to give one speech, and she did three of those. Uh, so the problem with that is that she won't even release the transcript. So what are you telling them behind closed doors, Hillary? I mean, you raised the question about Barack Obama and what he did behind closed doors with special interests, so why are you any different? Hypocrisy. Now, Tim's contention is that she claims that those speeches and the money she takes doesn't influence her. He explains, if that's the principled stance you want to take, it's not one her party has had in the past. Mitt Romney was hit hard in the 2012 presidential campaign by Democrats for speeches he gave to financial institutions. So which is it? Are politicians corrupt or susceptible to corruption if they are giving highly paid speeches behind closed doors to financial institutions or not? It doesn't work both ways. Now, another area of hypocrisy for Hillary Clinton is that she constantly condemns the Citizens United decision and the ruling was in fact about her. But since then, she is now one of the biggest beneficiaries of that decision. We all know Hillary Clinton has multiple super PACs. Well, the number is that she actually has seven 
known super PACs, so she could have more pro-Hillary super PACs out there, we just don't know about them. Uh, so she has seven known super PACs. So Hillary Clinton, she doesn't really feel the way she says she does about Citizens United. In actuality, it's benefited her a lot, more than many other politicians. Arguably, she's benefited the most from it. Now, Hillary Clinton supporters will contend that it doesn't matter because this isn't a quid pro quo. When these special interests give Hillary Clinton money, they're not literally asking for anything in exchange. So it's not direct corruption, but in actuality, it is still corruption. It's just the lesser degree of corruption, but corruption is corruption. And the thing is that nobody's ever said that these are quid pro quo. Nobody said that. Nobody's claimed that. We've su we've suggested it, but we've never directly said it. The problem is that these contributions set up a direct conflict of interest. These politicians are claiming to regulate the people who are helping to get them into office. That's a problem. There's a reason why the financial services industry has been able to get away with murder. There's a reason why the NRA is able to stifle any type of gun legislation we're getting through. These special interests bankroll the campaigns of politicians and they get through, and nine times out of ten, if you have more money, you win, especially when it comes to senatorial races. So, it's really problematic that they're taking all this money from special interests. Like any human being, of course you're going to be influenced by the people who literally make your career possible. So, it's actually egregious to contend that Hillary Clinton is not influenced by these donations. Now, my favorite part about the article is how Tim brings up Barney Frank. Now, Barney Frank, as you'll remember, I cover this, he suggested that Bernie Sanders is a guilty of McCarthyism for even suggesting that Hillary Clinton is influenced by the campaign contributions that she's received. But what Tim demonstrates is how the 2016 Barney Frank uh, is actually contradicted by the 2012 Barney Frank because he said something different. So by his own standards, Barney Frank is incorrect. So he states, people say, oh, it doesn't have any effect on me. Well, if that were the case, we'd be the only human beings in the history of the world who on a regular basis took significant amounts of money from perfect strangers and made sure that it had no effect on our behavior. And Tim states, I guess we can assume Clinton is the first person in the history of the world to avoid this problem altogether then. You can't argue with this. He's literally taking their own quotes and using it against them because they're changing their positions because Democrats were unequivocally against money in politics until one of their candidates is taking a lot of money. So which side are you on? Do you think that money in politics is a problem or not? You have to pick a side. You can't waver on your position depending on which candidate is up. Either you support the idea or you don't. It shouldn't vary depending on the candidate. So, of course, it's the case that Hillary Clinton is influenced by these campaign contributions. She's a human being. I know she seems like a robot most of the time, but she's a human being just like you and me. And that money influences her, her decisions. We have an unlimited number of examples. How she gave weapons deals to the Saudis after they donated to the Clinton Foundation. There's so many examples. I can go on all day. So, yes... Unfortunately, uh, I hate to break the news to all of Hillary Clinton's supporters, but Hillary Clinton is a human being, and like all human beings, she is influenced by the money she receives. I agree with you when you say that it's not acceptable for Republicans to accept large sums of money from special interests, but you have to be consistent. When Democrats do it, you have to call them out, and you have to not support them. You can't reverse your position because a candidate is up that you like. That's completely unreasonable. Either you have a position or you don't, and Hillary Clinton like her supporters, did a 180. And the problem is that the entire Democratic Party has done a 180. And this is problematic. This is completely problematic. I am not willing to change my position on money and politics because of Hillary Clinton. Now, the whole thing that's absurd to me is that uh, this, sh this should be common sense to Democratic voters. Democratic voters are more liberal and more intelligent. So this shouldn't be something that I have to explain to fellow liberals. It should just be common sense. But the problem that it's not shows that not only the Democratic Party is in a really bad state, but the country is in a bad state if the Liberal Party and their supporters are not willing to call out campaign contributions and the conflict of interest uh, that it poses. Bill Clinton is at it again. At a recent campaign event, he condescendingly suggested that Bernie Sanders supporters are so extreme that they actually want violence against Wall Street executives. Take a look. I think it's fine that all these young students have been so enthusiastic for her opponent and sound so good. Just shoot every third person on Wall Street and everything will be fine. 
just shoot every third person on Wall Street and everything would be fine. So this is an obvious attempt to demonize Bernie Sanders supporters, and this has been a go-to tactic for Bill Clinton in this campaign to discredit Bernie Sanders. He tries to paint the picture that Bernie Sanders is an illegitimate candidate because his supporters are crazy and unrealistic, and he has a bunch of Looney Tunes following him. Particularly, he does this to young people. So he's claimed that Bernie Sanders supporters are sexist, they're unrealistic, uh, and he even compared them to members of the Tea Party at one point, suggesting that they're just all extremists. But in actuality, we're not the extremists, Bill. This is the definition of a straw man argument, and it's not a very smart case to make if you expect to ask for our votes come November. It's just not. You don't continue to demonize supporters of a candidate over and over and still expect to unite the party come November. It's just not a smart strategy, and I don't know what you think you're doing or are going to accomplish with this. I'm one of Bernie Sanders' younger supporters who Bill Clinton thinks is crazy, an extremist apparently, and I've spoken to hundreds of Bernie Sanders supporters, and I think that I can't speak for everyone, but I can speak for certainly a large number of us and tell you exactly what we want. We don't want any Wall Street executives to be killed. We don't want violence. We would never advocate for that. What we want is for them to go to jail and be prosecuted for their wrongdoings. That's not unreasonable. I think that's the go-to reasonable position, and if you don't agree with that, then you're the extremist. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, it's actually us who are the ones against the death penalty. Last time I checked, you and Hillary are in favor of the death penalty. What you went through and how terrible those days and nights must have been for all those years. And I know that all of us are so regretful that you or any person has to go through what you did. And I hope that now that you are standing here before us that you will have whatever path in life you choose. So to suggest that we're the ones who want violence, it's egregious. It's absolutely absurd. Now, seeing that Bill Clinton committed voter fraud in Massachusetts and lied under oath, he thinks that the rich and the powerful shouldn't be punished for their wrongdoings. But all we're asking is for the U.S. government to hold these criminals accountable for their wrongdoings when they commit fraud, when they crash the economy. Why is that so extreme? It doesn't make sense to me. Only someone who's unreasonable and out of touch would suggest that to want to jail these criminals is absurd. That's not the case, Bill. You're the one who was the extremist in this scenario. I hate to break it to you, but it's true. And see, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, they don't want to jail these criminals. In fact, Hillary Clinton is friends with them. She took $225,000 from them to give one paid speech, and they liked it so much, they had her back twice three times. So of course you don't think that these people who are guilty of fraud and criminal activity who crashed the economy should go to jail, and I find that absolutely unforgivable. But the thing that is even worse is that you take it a step further, you suggest that we're so disenfranchised, so peeved about their actions that we would actually suggest killing them. No, we are never in favor of violence as progressives. You're the ones in favor of violence because you support the death penalty. See, as progressives, we don't want blood. We want justice. That's the reasonable position, and to disagree with that shows that you're the extremist, Bill. The RNC chair, Rance Priebus, was on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, and when asked which of the two remaining Democratic candidates he would rather face come November, this was what he had to say. Who do you worry about more uh, facing the Republican nominee, whoever that nominee might turn out to be, uh, Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders? Oh, I'm much more. I'm, I'm much more comfortable, and I think uh, I think everyone that analyzes this knows that Hillary Clinton's in the ditch. Uh, we don't know how far in the ditch she's going to go, uh, but she's not doing well. She's not even winning. And, you know, she's lost seven out of eight pr uh, contests, I believe. Maybe it's eight out of nine. Um, so she's not winning. She's not but popular. She has. She has uh, a two unfortunately million, for she her, she's not likable. Hold on a second, um, Ryan. She has two more, almost two and a half million more votes right now in all of the contests uh, over Bernie Sanders. She has a million more votes than Donald Trump has, and Donald Trump has a lot more, almost two million more votes than Ted Cruz. So on the popular vote, well, in you asked more me. than 30 contests so far, she's, she's doing pretty well. But you asked me who would, be, who would be better to run against, and I'm telling you I'd rather run against Hillary Clinton because she's defined, she's not liked, 
And, you know, in a popular cultural vote in America, that's a really important question, and she doesn't do well on that question. And I don't know what's going to happen with the FBI. So put her unpopularity together with another unknown that could make it even harder for her, I would rather run against Hillary Clinton. I'm just answering your question. All right. Now, for the first time, perhaps ever, Rance Priebus is correct about something. The combination of Hillary Clinton's low net likability ratings, as well as the ongoing FBI investigation against her, make her the better candidate to face. But the thing that really struck me is how Wolf Blitzer, his head almost exploded when he heard Rance say that. Like, he, he couldn't fathom why anyone would be more scared of Bernie Sanders than Hillary Clinton, because apparently polls don't exist to these mainstream uh, political pundits. Now, he tried to even make excuses for why the RNC should be more afraid of Hillary Clinton. He's saying, oh, well, she has more pledge delegates and she has millions more votes than Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and whatnot. And Rand said, but look, you asked me which one I'd rather face come November, and it's it's Hillary Clinton, not Bernie Sanders. Now, Rance is 100% right. If you're a Republican, you would be much better against Hillary Clinton than Bernie Sanders, and that varies depending on the candidate. Now, I'm going to tell you why. Now, to figure out who's the best candidate the Republicans should want to go against come November, what you want to do is look at aggregate polling data from hypothetical matchups of Democratic candidates versus the Republican candidates. Now, I like to use real clear politics. So when it comes to Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, she actually has a 9.9 .9 advantage overall. And when it comes to Hillary versus Cruz, she has a 3.4 point advantage. But when it comes to John Kasich, she actually has a 6.7 point disadvantage. Now, John Kasich beats her by as much as 9 points in a couple of polls, and in the 7 polls conducted since March, Hillary Clinton loses to John Kasich in all of them. So, that's one of the reasons why Rance Priebus probably wants to go against Hillary Clinton rather than Bernie Sanders. When you look at hypothetical matchups of Republicans against Bernie Sanders, you have a completely different story. Now... When it comes to Bernie versus Trump, Bernie has a 16.3 point advantage. When it comes to Bernie versus Cruz, Bernie has an 11.2 point advantage. And when it comes to Bernie Sanders versus John Kasich, look at that. He beats John Kasich. He actually has a 3.3 point advantage. So not only does Bernie Sanders outperform Hillary Clinton when it comes to the Republican candidates, he significantly outperforms her when it comes to Donald Trump and Ted Cruz. And again, I just want to reiterate, Hillary Clinton loses to John Kasich. How scary is that? So if you're the Republicans and you're going to have a contested convention and they put up John Kasich against Hillary Clinton, as it stands now, Hillary Clinton would lose to John Kasich. So this is something that's incredibly frightening. So of course, Rance Priebus is correct to say that he'd rather go against Hillary Clinton than Bernie Sanders because Ber Bernie Sanders whoops the ass of any Republican he's up against. And this isn't just true for these three candidates. It's also the case for all the other candidates, Ben Carson, Chris Christie before. The only one that Bernie Sanders actually loses to was Carly Fiorina, and it was by a fraction of a percent. So the fact that uh, Rance Priebus has the audacity to actually say that they'd rather face Hillary Clinton, it blows people's minds because they don't see why you can't like Hillary Clinton because CNN, the Clinton News Network, well, they love Hillary Clinton. Uh, Time Warner is their parent company and they're one of Hillary Clinton's top contributors. So of course, Hillary Clinton is a god to them. So when someone goes against the grain and says, no, actually, we'd rather face Hillary than Bernie. We're not afraid of uh, Hillary or, or we're not afraid of Hillary Clinton. It's something that they just can't understand, and it's because they don't look at data, they don't have facts on their side, and they're not living in reality. They're living in an alternate reality where anything they want to believe is what they think is true, but that's not the way the real world works. You have to look at data, you have to look at the numbers, and when you do, you'll see that Bernie Sanders is the much stronger candidate to go against any of the Republicans. And that's been true since we started doing these hypothetical matchups. In New York, Bernie Sanders recently drew a crowd of over 27,000 people. Now, one would normally take this as a sign of excitement that his campaign is generating, but David Cantonese of US News actually took it as an opportunity to attack Bernie Sanders and praise Hillary Clinton. Yes, you heard me right. This one journalist at US News is criticizing Bernie Sanders because his crowds are too large and praising Hillary Clinton because her crowds are smaller. This is not satirical. I literally had to check because it reads like a satire article, but it's not. This is real quote journalism nowadays, guys. So let's get to the argument. I'm gonna try not to laugh because it's 
absolutely absurd. So he argues, Clinton's events in the Empire State routinely focus on a particular subset of voters, allowing her to narrow cast a specific message that resonates with them. Whether it be women, African Americans, or seniors, the Clinton operation is ever cognizant about catering to the targeted group's sweet spots. Sanders, meanwhile, continues to rely on the mega rally, packing as many supporters as he can into a venue, and delivering his standard sermon of progressive platitudes, an approach that has defined his campaign from the start. Oh, is that what you want to call it? <laughs> really? <laughs> So if she has low turnout at her events because nobody wants to show up and she's not exciting her own supporters, you call that targeted events? Are you kidding me? You're clearly angry at the fact that Bernie Sanders is drawing more crowds than Hillary Clinton. That's not by design. She's just getting lower turnouts because people aren't coming to hear her speak. Bernie Sanders literally has to change venues. He did it in my state when he came to Portland. He had to switch venues a week before the event because he had so many people wanting to come. There's a reason why Hillary Clinton is not generating excitement. She's a buzzkill candidate. She's not proposing anything new or revolutionary. All she's saying is, you know, I'm going to be Obama's third term, which is fine if you like Obama, but that's not going to excite everyone. We have severe problems that she is not planning to address, such as the healthcare crisis. Obamacare is not going to do very much, even if you expand it. If we get to 100% of coverage with Obamacare, well, you're still going to have many people underinsured. That's not exciting anyone. Universal healthcare, something that will literally save lives, that's exciting people. Nobody's thinking, oh, well, I guess I'm going to vote for Hillary because she's more practical and she has experience. Oh, I just can barely contain my excitement. <laughs> like, w there's no excitement there. That's why she's getting low crowds, not because she planned it. It's not by design. It's because nobody wants to hear her speak. Now, I also really like how he calls what Bernie Sanders says platitudes. So when Bernie Sanders spends more than an hour at his events talking about very specific policies, such as universal health care to all citizens and free education by uh, taxing Wall Street speculation, that's not specific. But when Hillary Clinton says, we're going to break down all the barriers, that's specific. That's not a platitude. This argument is borderline delusional. It's just... It's just so far removed from the real world that you can't help but think this is satire. Now, he goes on to praise Hillary Clinton, particularly because she focuses extensively on women's issues, but there's a problem with that. Uh, so <laughs> I'll get to that in a minute. So he says, to be fair, Sanders regularly lists equal pay for equal work in his speeches as a goal he shares, but he often mentions it only briefly before readily moving on to other topics. Clinton's willingness to devote entire events to single issues conveys a dedication and sophistication that reverberates with voters looking for more than slogans. Pay equity is just one example of the hyper-focused Clinton campaign strategy. Now, he talks at length about how Hillary Clinton is right to fight for equal pay for equal work, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to break some bad news to you, David. It's just rhetoric. Now, there's evidence for this because if Hillary Clinton was actually really trying to get something done about the gender pay gap, you'd think she would start by addressing the pay gap within her own foundation. Because according to the Daily Caller, male executives at the Clinton Foundation make 38% more than women. So if she really was concerned about the pay gap, wouldn't she start where she could actually make a difference immediately? I mean, it's really telling, and the reason why I don't think Hillary Clinton cares about the pay gap, and the reason why Bernie Sanders cares more about it, even though it's the case that uh, she's a woman, is because she's a multimillionaire. Now, again, the gender pay gap, it's actually overstated. It's more like four to six cents in terms of the pay gap. So there's a lot of misinformation around the topic, but I mean, even if you propose legislation to address that four to six cents, you know, hopefully it can make a difference. It's not going to do anything bad. So I'm not against it, but... I'm saying that if a candidate really cares about it, they should do everything they can to uh, to stop the pay gap in areas where there actually is a pay gap in the Clinton Foundation. But he gets into talking about the crowds again, and he says that it doesn't matter that Bernie Sanders is drawing all these crowds in New York because uh, he is down in the polls. He's not polling well with African-Americans in New York. He's down by like 40 points. Uh, but it does matter because if you have these large crowds, you're generating excitement. You're then getting press coverage. And then you could have someone hear about Bernie Sanders because of it. So it very much does matter. And the point that I want to make is that, you know, you would be really excited if Hillary Clinton was drawing 27,000 people. But the fact that she's not, it just makes you jealous. You don't like Bernie Sanders. Therefore, any and everything that he does and doesn't do is going to be a point that you're going to criticize him on. 
I know the tactic. This is what the Democratic Party, the political establishment, uh, the media establishment has been doing since he announced his presidential bid. So you're not doing anything new. You're not being revolutionary here. Now, finally, he contrasts Bernie Sanders' more chaotic uh, multi-thousand people crowds with Hillary Clinton's more personable, eloquent speeches. So he says, at the Glassdoor roundtable where barely a few hundred people showed up and some seats in the theater were empty, it's embarrassing, <laughs> Clinton was asked if she was hopeful the issue of pay equity was garnering real traction in the political realm. She didn't deliver a stem winder of an answer or one that could be easily tossed on a bumper sticker but she left those in attendance with the strong impression that she would be committed to following through on it later. Oh, well, isn't she just a pragmatist? I mean, she's the one candidate that's actually realistic, right? This is ridiculous. I'm so sick of Hillary the pragmatist and this notion that she's the only person who's actually committed to fighting for things or that she's the only person that can get things done. I've got really bad news for you, buddy, but the Republicans don't like Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton, so either one of them would have a hard time fighting against the Republican-controlled Congress. But do you want to know who uh, the party hates more than uh, Bernie Sanders? Hillary Clinton. They've been lining up the Benghazi attack, for example, years before she even announced her candidacy. And it's just a political attack. There's no evidence of any wrongdoing. So this is honestly, this article is embarrassing. It's just embarrassing. You're literally arguing that it's bad for Bernie Sanders to have these huge crowds and generate excitement, and you're arguing that Hillary Clinton's events with a couple hundred people is a good thing. Uh, did you not think before you wrote this? Did nobody, like, read this in question? Really? You're going to make this argument? There's a hundred different ways that you could come up with the BS attack against Bernie Sanders, and this isn't something that reflects poorly on Bernie Sanders. It just reflects poorly on you, and U.S. news, your, quote, news organization. Having good crowds is an indication that he's generating grassroots excitement, and this is good for his campaign. Either way, like, no matter how you want to slice it, it's a benefit. Nobody's ever argued before that having large crowds is bad or detrimental to a candidate's campaign or that it's somehow going to be bad in terms of influencing uh, the vote. Nobody's ever made this argument. This is unique. And, and furthermore, the reason why Hillary Clinton has more votes is because you'd be surprised at how having Clinton as your last name is automatically going to yield you with a lot more name recognition. Political science studies have shown time and again that voters are reluctant to support candidates that they're unaware of or ballot propositions that they've never heard of. So if they don't really know too much about something, they're just going to... Uh, revert back to what they know best about. And if they don't know about Bernie Sanders, which still, unfortunately, many people don't, then they're just going to support Hillary Clinton because they at least know that she's better than the Republicans. So the reason why Hillary Clinton is winning, embarrassingly enough, is because low-information voters are choosing her because they don't know about the viable option that is Bernie Sanders. They don't know that he is more electorally viable in, no in November against Republicans. So this whole argument about the crowds is the most ridiculous attack on Bernie Sanders I've seen yet. And trust me, I've gone through a lot. You can go through my channel. I've seen a lot. But criticizing Bernie Sanders and attacking him because he has large crowds, it just reflects poorly on you, not Bernie Sanders. This is a pathetic attempt at an attack on Bernie Sanders. Now, as you all know by now, Senator Jeff Merkley from Oregon became the first senator to officially endorse Bernie Sanders. And this is really, really important. It's a big deal. And I wanted to talk about this and explain why it's so huge. Uh, and also this is, you know, it hits close to home because Jeff Merkley is my senator. So I wanted to talk about his op-ed that he penned for the New York Times. He states, no decision we make as Americans more dramatically affects the direction of our country than our choice for president. The president reflects, but also helps define our national values, priorities, and direction. After considering our biggest challenges facing our nation and the future I want for my children and our country, I have decided to become the first member of the Senate to support my colleague Bernie Sanders for president. So already, he made a phenomenal point. Many people contend that Bernie Sanders' policies are pie in the sky, they'll never get through, but just having those positions influences the direction of the country. What direction do you want to go in? Do you want to go in Hillary Clinton's direction where we have endless war and where universal health care is not even on the table? Or do you want Bernie Sanders, who is at least fighting for things that we should have? Well, 
The answer will vary depending on if you have common sense or not. But he continues, Under President Obama's leadership, our country is fairer and more prosperous for all than it was seven years ago. But as we look toward the next administration, there is far more work to do. We need urgency. We need big ideas. We need to rethink the status quo. It is time to recommit ourselves to that vision of a country that measures our nation's success not at the boardroom table, but at kitchen tables across America. Bernie Sanders stands for that America, and so I stand with Bernie Sanders for president. Now here's why this is significant. So out of 44 Democratic senators, 40 of them have endorsed Hillary Clinton and zero endorsed Bernie Sanders up until Jeff Merkley's endorsement. So so this this is uh it says a lot. There's implications to this, right? They agree with her hawkish pro corporatist policy. So that means that we don't have a liberal party. Hillary Clinton is a center right politician. She's not a liberal. So this is really scary. So the fact that finally one senator came out and endorsed Bernie Sanders is really big. He needed this so badly. Now if anyone was gonna endorse Bernie Sanders it would either be, in my opinion, probably Elizabeth Warren or Jeff Merkley, because Jeff Merkley is a true progressive. He's probably the only other true progressive besides Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, at least when it comes to the Senate. And he has been ahead of his time on many issues. So, for example, he was the first senator to actually support legalizing marijuana. Uh, and this guy has been, time and again, he's been there for us. So as someone who is from Oregon and who voted for Jeff Merkley, needless to say, I am very happy with the turnout, with, you know, the product that we got. He was right there with with Elizabeth Warren in 2014. She was uh, trying to help raise money for him. And he was going up against Monica Webby, who was someone who was bankrolled by the Koch brothers. And he whooped that ass by double digits in 2014 and while all other democratic senators were running away from the party were running away from obama's record and pretending to be republicans jeff merkley said no i'm a liberal i'm a progressive and that's why i love him so here's the thing about oregon we are a very liberal state especially when it comes to portland which is my stomping ground but like many other states we have many democrats who are pro corporatist establishment Democrats who are out of touch. So I want to go through those with you guys because I think that this political situation in Oregon, it's honestly somewhat frustrating, even though uh, I probably wouldn't pick any other state to live in in terms of policy and the political climate than Oregon, there's still some problems. So for example, our other senator is Ron Wyden. Now this is an individual who many times I was very happy with and he was initially against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but what happened is he was lobbied and all of a sudden, he got thousands of dollars donated to his campaign, and lo and behold, he changed his position. And he also endorsed Hillary Clinton. So, Ron Wyden is going bye-bye, not voting for him. He does have a progressive challenger, and I will be giving my vote to that individual. Now, we also have Governor Kate Brown. So, this is really interesting because we didn't elect Kate Brown. So, if you all know, if you know anything about Oregon politics, our previous governor, John Kitzhaber, he was ousted because... He was corrupt. Uh, there was a scandal. And I didn't vote for him. I actually voted third party uh, in the last election because I just couldn't take John Kitzhaber anymore. He wasn't a true progressive. He wasn't a liberal. He was just, you know, I mean, he did get some good things. I don't want to diminish his record entirely, but he wasn't facilitating the change we need. Now, Kate Brown, in terms of policy, I think she's delivered at this point. But here's the thing. Uh, I'm very suspicious of her because she's in the pockets of Nestle and Comcast. So there's there's some red flags right there. But also... She endorsed Hillary Clinton when Oregon is most likely going to be a state that votes overwhelmingly in favor of Bernie Sanders. So you can bet that if Bernie Sanders does win Oregon, and it's by a lot, actually if he just wins in general, I'll be making some calls to her office and uh, trying to persuade her to change her position and actually endorse Bernie Sanders and support him at the convention in Philadelphia because if we didn't vote for her then she needs to take extra steps to listen to what we need but other than that I don't have any problems with Kate Brown but I will if she doesn't change her vote if Bernie Sanders does win uh, in Oregon. Now we also have Suzanne Bonamici and Kurt Schrader both are house members from Oregon both endorsed uh, Hillary Clinton and the one that I'm most bitter about is Earl Blumenauer. This has been one of my favorite congressmen time and again he stood on the floor, and it was in a viral video. Everybody watched it and loved it. He was uh, defending marijuana legalization. And I, I always thought he was a true progressive, but 
he has endorsed Hillary Clinton. Now, I actually made a video where I, I talked to Earl Blumenauer and I was trying to convince him to support Bernie Sanders and endorse Bernie Sanders because I said that, you know, his policies are more in line with Bernie Sanders. They're both progressives, but he endorsed Hillary Clinton. And so obviously what I said didn't resonate. And I, I had mentioned in the video, I'll post it down below, that I didn't feel as though what I said resonated with Representative Blumenauer. So I was very, very disappointed in my discussion with him. And I felt like even, you know, the most progressive people were sellouts or too afraid to stand up to the Clinton machine. So in the end, that's the political situation in Oregon, just to kind of give you a rundown of it. Uh, but when it comes to the endorsement, this is fundamentally important. Uh, and I would encourage anyone from Oregon to really call Jeff Merkley's office and thank him because this takes a lot of courage. You don't understand the power of the Clinton machine and how much courage it takes to stand up to them and go against the grain and go against the entire political establishment. I mean, he's swimming against the stream and that's something that could have political repercussions, but nonetheless, he did it. And this is why I'm so happy with Jeff Merkley. Uh, so best believe I will be supporting him again uh, come his uh, re-election, which I don't know when that is. It's going to be four years from now. So 2020, I'll be supporting his campaign again. So thank you so much, Senator Merkley. I'm glad you're feeling the burn. At CNN's Democratic debate in New York, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders clashed really, really hard. Now, I'm going to give you my thoughts on the debate, but uh, just the general things that I noticed is that Hillary Clinton got booed at this debate probably more times than any other debate. Uh, now, furthermore, they didn't give either of the candidates enough time to answer any of the questions. They tried to cut them off just too much. And I thought that they should have allowed both candidates more time to answer the questions without being in interrupted because there's two candidates. So there's no need to rush. And the debate was really long. Like I felt like it was two and a half, maybe three hours. Uh, so it was a really long debate. There was absolutely no reason to cut off both of the candidates. But with that being said, people who analyzed the debate, uh, they did find that Hillary Clinton did speak overall for about 10 minutes more than Bernie Sanders, which, which seems about right to me. Uh, now, the winner of the debate overall, in my opinion, is Bernie Sanders, but there's a but to that. So with the last debate that they had, I felt like Bernie Sanders crushed Hillary Clinton, but the problem is that he did not have a crushing victory this time as he did last time. I think that Hillary Clinton overall probably outperformed him in the first part of the debate. In the first half, she she got him on some pretty big areas like guns. I thought that, unfortunately, Bernie Sanders did not come out looking good on this issue. But overall, when it comes to winner and the loser, I think that it was pretty close, but Bernie Sanders is the overall winner, in my opinion. So I have some notes of some things here that I wanted to talk about. When it comes to the question of what instance can you name where Hillary's Wall Street contributions influenced her, Bernie Sanders did not answer this one uh, in the manner that I think was satisfactory to the people who are a little bit on the fence about Hillary Clinton. To Bernie supporters, he's already convinced them. But to Hillary supporters, he's certainly not going to convince them. And to people on the fence, I don't necessarily think that his, his uh, answer was satisfactory. Now, what I would have said personally is, look, we don't necessarily have any concrete examples when it comes to her Wall Street donations. All we have is evidence from before and how, for example, with the bankruptcy bill, how she flipped her position when she became a senator and uh, once she began taking uh, campaign contributions from the financial services industry. But we have a lot more examples from other uh, sectors, such as the health insurance industry. She was in favor of universal health care, and then she flipped once they greased her palms, and now she doesn't support universal health care. She admits to that. So I think that if you would have used that example, it would have been a little bit better, but they were very narrow in trying to suggest how uh, she was influenced. And the thing is that, look, even if it's the case that there's no concrete examples, it's still a conflict of interest. You're claiming that you're going to regulate the people who you're taking money from. So I think he should have made that case, but the framing of the question in general kind of set him up to fail. So that was really disappointing because that was a good opportunity for Bernie Sanders to really shine in an area where, you know, typically it should have been easy for him to do so, but I think that that wasn't the case. Now, she also again mentioned how she called out Wall Street and quote, spoke out against some of their privileges. And Bernie's response to this was fantastic. He said, well, they must have been really upset by what you said. And was this before or after uh, they gave you money to speak for them? 
That was brutal. I mean, in some of these uh, instances, Bernie Sanders had no chill. It was hilarious. Uh, Now, she also said that she's the only one on stage that didn't vote to deregulate swaps and derivatives. This is a very disingenuous point. If you've watched the segment from Tom Hartman, who does a phenomenal job at breaking this down, her husband is the one that pushed to deregulate swaps and derivatives. The reason why Bernie Sanders voted the way he did is because this was attached to a bill that he had to vote for. It was a spending bill. So this is incredibly disingenuous on Hillary Clinton's behalf. Now, getting to the speech transcripts, this was the worst part of the night for Hillary Clinton, and it was so bad for her. She got booed badly by the audience, and actually kudos to Dana Bash, who actually pushed her on this issue, but I don't have too much nice things to say about the moderators other than that. You're running now for the Democratic nomination. Right. And it it is your Democratic opponent and many Democratic voters who want to see those transcripts. It's not about the Republicans at this point. And let, you know, let's set the same standard for everybody. When everybody does it, okay, I will do it. But let's set and expect the same standard on tax returns. Everybody does it, and then we move forward. Uh, Now, Bernie Sanders unfortunately, couldn't hit her on this as hard as he usually does because of the tax return issue. Now, we all know that the tax return issue is not a big deal. Bernie Sanders released his 2014 return today, and of course, it's boring. But the problem is that it was something that Hillary Clinton was able to use against him. So I really wish that Bernie Sanders would have taken the time to just release it ahead of the debate because I don't necessarily think it made him look bad, but he couldn't use the transcripts against Hillary Clinton as much. Thankfully, Dana Bash did push her on this. But she just looked so bad and so disingenuous, and it looks as though she's hiding something, uh, and for good reason, because she obviously is. Um, So I'm glad that this was uh, a big issue, but Bernie Sanders couldn't necessarily push her as hard as he usually does, so thankfully the moderator stepped in for him. Now, when it comes to minimum wage, Hillary Clinton, she did a complete 180. She flip-flopped, and Bernie Sanders was correct on this. He said history has outpaced Hillary Clinton on this issue, and this is characteristic of her entire career. Hillary Clinton always is behind with the times on every issue when it comes to war, when it comes to LGBT rights. She always is the last within the Democratic Party to come around. And she's doing the same thing with a number of issues now, like the Syrian no-fly zone, like the minimum wage, uh, like many other issues, just to name a few. So I think that this is something that she should take a lot more heat for, but she's not. And it's because she's being incredibly disingenuous. She says, quote, I said from the very beginning, I supported the fight for 15. But then she immediately contradicted herself by saying, well, you know, I support 12 and 15 if we have a Democratic Congress. What do you mean if you have a Democratic Congress? So you're only going to fight for us depending on the condition of Congress. So if it's fully Republican, you're just going to compromise 100%. This is not a real position. Take a stance, Hillary Clinton. And no, you cannot convince us that you supported 15 from the beginning because in the second debate, Martin O'Malley and Bernie Sanders were arguing with you over this and you stood there and you supported the $12 minimum wage. So you don't get to take credit for this. So that was another area where she looked bad. But where Hillary Clinton excelled is when it comes to guns. Now, she said, oh, you know, this is where there's a big difference between me and Bernie, which is not true. But he laughed when she said that because it's such a ridiculous statement. And her response was, it's not funny. It's not a laughing matter. But we all know that Hillary Clinton does her little nervous laugh at everything. So that was a little smooth move there and a really dirty tactic to try to get Bernie Sanders to look as though he doesn't take guns seriously. When in actuality, he was laughing at the ridiculousness of her statement that this is where they have uh, a big difference. No, they're basically the same. The one difference is gun manufacturer rights. And we all know that Hillary Clinton flip-flopped on guns because in 2008, she was trying to run to the right of Obama on this issue. Uh, Now, basically, she... I thought that she did a good job and was persuasive, even though I don't believe her, but I think it's going to be persuasive to voters who are on the fence. Uh, She said that... uh, the gun lobby's greed is akin to Wall Street's greed, and this was a good tactic on her part. Now, also, she framed Bernie Sanders as a supporter of the NRA, which is a complete lie. He has a D- minus rating from them, but I think that she did it in a way that was assertive and that it's probably believable to the average low-information viewer. Now, Bernie Sanders' question that was asked by the moderators is the dumbest question of the night. Uh, Wolf Blitzer asked him, do you owe the family of victims of Sandy Hook an apology because you do not believe they should sue gun manufacturers? 
Really? And he, he asked this twice. How could you ask this? So are you going to go ahead and ask Hillary Clinton if she owes the families of soldiers who she sent to Iraq to die an apology? Are you going to ask her that? What about, uh, does she owe an apology to the families of civilians in Iraq that died because of her war? What a horrible question. And to imply that Bernie Sanders has blood on his hands over this, it's completely ridiculous. To be able to sue gun manufacturers for gun violence is a completely unreasonable position. And if you're a liberal, you're not being reasonable here. You're just as unreasonable as the right-wing Republicans who say that they don't want any gun reform, uh, no background checks, no nothing. You're being just as unreasonable here with that issue. Now, there were some great moments for Bernie Sanders. So he made a great point on climate change by saying that if we had an enemy that threatened us as bad as climate change, everyone would be taking action. Such a phenomenal point. He also said that Hillary led the effort in Obama's administration for regime change in Libya, which is good. He brought up the Syrian no-fly zone and how even Obama doesn't support that, which is a phenomenal point because Hillary Clinton is always championing Obama. He's a god. You can't critique him. I'm with Obama 100%, but when it comes to the Syrian no-fly zone, it proves how even she's more hawkish than Obama. That was a phenomenal point. Bernie Sanders needs to stick with this talking point. This is uh, not just an attack on me. It's an attack on President Obama. Cool. President Obama. Now, another dumb question that was asked to Bernie Sanders again, of course, is uh, Donald Trump says similar, similar things to you when it comes to NATO. How is what you say different? Okay, so what they're trying to do here is draw comparisons between Bernie Sanders and Trump to show Democratic voters how similar Bernie is to Trump. Well, I'm sorry, but if Trump is right on an issue, then he's right on an, on an issue. He's right on trade. He was right on the Iraq war. So it's not the case that Donald Trump is just unequivocally bad and wrong on every single issue. He's wrong on 99.9% .9 of the issues, but this was very disingenuous. And you could just see, like, uh, it just, it's very blatant what they're trying to do. Now, one thing that I loved where Bernie Sanders shined and why I think he won is because he was so clear on, on Israel. So uh, he said that um, their response to Gaza in 2014 was disproportionate. This is common sense. If you think that their response wasn't disproportionate to kill 80 to 90% civilians, I, I just don't think you're reasonable. And Bernie Sanders said the right thing, even though it's not something that you really want to say, but many Americans think it, think it everyone in the world thinks it, but because we have such a strong pro-Israeli lobby, uh, you can't criticize Israel ever. But Bernie Sanders did a great job here at proving that, you know, he's a champion of progressive policies no matter what the consequences are. And that's someone who I like. He's principled. He's not going to take a stance for political expediency. And that's why so many people love him. And he proved it once again with Israel. And Hillary Clinton looked bad by dodging the question on whether or not they use disproportionate uh, force. And furthermore, uh, Bernie Sanders called her out at her speech at APAC because she didn't even mention Palestinians. So she can't pretend as though she cares about Palestinians when she didn't even mention them. Now, another dumb question was asked to Bernie Sanders on how, uh, whether or not his policies are fiscally responsible. This has been a question posed to Bernie Sanders so much, but I think this is outrageous because nobody asks this to the Republicans when they say they want to start wars with Iran. Nobody asks this when they say they want to rebuild the military, meaning that they're just going to increase military spending even more when it already accounts for 57% of our discretionary spending. It, it's completely unacceptable. So healthcare, you know, you better make sure you're fiscally responsible in that department. But when it comes to war and killing people, have at it. We're not going to even question you. Do what you want. You have a blank check there. It's just unacceptable, and it really just shows the double standard and how our priorities in America are all screwed up. So that was the third dumb question of the night that CNN asked. So I don't have nothing good to say to the moderators, with the exception of Dana Bash and how she actually pushed Hillary Clinton pretty hard on her speech transcripts. But other than that, they did a piss poor job. Now, Hillary Clinton continues to lie about Bernie Sanders' universal health care plan. Uh, and it was good for Bernie Sanders to once again state the obvious that other countries do it. Uh, he lives in Vermont. It's like 50 miles from Canada. And guess what? They do it. Many other countries do it. The problem is that Americans, they, they're so myopic. They can't look abroad and see that something is working out really well in basically every other modern industrialized nation. So maybe we should do it because our health care system isn't working. Even if you have health insurance in America, 
you could still die or go bankrupt because many people with insurance under Obamacare, mind you, are underinsured. So that means that, one, you're probably paying a ton for your premium every month, and two, you're not going to get the help you need if you get sick because your deductible could be five, ten thousand dollars It's just completely unreasonable, and our system is broken. We need universal health care. Uh, now, finally, Hillary Clinton did flip-flop when it comes to Social Security. Now, she said, I've said the same thing for years, but this is not true at all. In the first Democratic debate, she stated that she was not in favor of lifting the cap on taxable income when it comes to Social Security. What she was in favor of then is means testing, so that way the poor recipients get more. Now, I've stated why this is a dangerous plan. Now, in theory, it sounds good on paper, but in actuality, it's an actually really deceptive move to help uh, diminish and undermine public support for Social Security. I'll put a link in the description box to this video where I talk about it and how it's just very bad and how because of this position, we cannot trust Hillary on Social Security. I'm glad she came around, but I still don't trust her because she's just changing her position because Bernie Sanders pressured her to do so, and he's more progressive on this. So in the end, when it comes to the debate, uh, again, I think that Bernie Sanders won, but I was really hoping for a blowout like the last debate, but unfortunately, we didn't get that. Both candidates performed pretty well. I was really hoping for Bernie Sanders to just be the clear winner, but that's not the case. But in the end, I still do think that just getting his message out there is a win for Bernie Sanders, because his biggest hurdle is name recognition. And we need all the name recognition we can going into New York, because this is going to be an uphill battle. Uh, so in the end, it was a great, entertaining debate, but uh, I really want to see the Bernie Sanders from the last debate come back. Well, that is the episode. I want to thank all of my subscribers for tuning in so loyally each week. And I also want to welcome anyone who's new to the channel. Uh, feel free to stop by and look at all of our other videos. I'm still in the process of getting all the old episodes up on iTunes and whatnot. So bear with me. This is such a pain in the butt and I'm having some technical difficulties with it. So I'm trying to work through those, but I'm trying to get them up as soon as possible. So that way each week you can get the audio podcast uh, along with the video podcast and I'm trying to expand us to as many platforms as possible so please bear with me this is a, an ongoing process but in the coming weeks I will be making a huge technical upgrade to the set so you guys can look forward to that uh, I won't tell you what it is now because I don't know how long it's going to take for me to finish this uh, but just know that big things are coming for the humanist report uh, I will see you guys next week thank you so much for tuning in Tonight was a really difficult night for obvious reasons if you're a Bernie Sanders supporter. So Hillary Clinton won New York handily. So she won by about 16 points, 57.7 to Bernie's 42.3. We knew that New York would be an uphill battle. I mean, when 126,000 registered Democrats are purged from the system in Brooklyn, when we have a closed primary that restricted you from switching parties back in October, we knew this was going to be a really tough battle. So is it the case that after tonight, after Hillary Clinton winning by such a wide margin, that this has diminished Bernie Sanders' chances of winning? Look, I have to tell you the truth. It'd be irresponsible if I lied to you. Uh, we have to be factual. We have to be objective. And yes, it is the case that it will be very difficult for Bernie Sanders to secure the nomination at this point. The odds are in Hillary Clinton's favor. But what does this mean for Bernie Sanders supporters? Do we give up? Is this a knockout punch where we just lay down and die? Do we acquiesce to the corporatist conservative Democratic Party? No way. Hillary Clinton was hoping that Bernie Sanders would lay down and die, that his supporters would give up after tonight if she won. And that's what many of us are going to do. That's what some people are going to do. That's what they want us to do. But I'm not going to do that because if we acquiesce, if we concede, if we admit that we're going to quit and we're not going to fight any longer, then we concede and allow the people who say that healthcare isn't a right to win. We let the people who say that money should remain in politics win. If we give up, we give the Democratic Party permission to continue to put forth these hawkish candidates who are almost as bad as Republicans when it comes to invading other countries. That's not acceptable. Bernie Sanders will remain in this race until the convention, and we're not going anywhere, even if it's the case that Hillary Clinton officially becomes the Democratic nominee. And Bernie Sanders is out. Do you think that I'm all of a sudden going to be quiet? You think that I'm just going to unequivocally lend my support to Hillary Clinton, who doesn't think money should be out of politics? Who has benefited more from Citizens United than almost any other candidate in this race, including Republicans? You think I'm just going to be quiet and vote for her? 
man, I've got really, really bad news for you. Now, I already know I'm going to be blamed because, look, Bernie Sanders and his supporters, they're preventing us from uniting the party. No, you want to know who's not uniting the party? Hillary Clinton, who just a couple weeks ago said that young people don't do their research. You want to know who's tearing the party apart? Bill Clinton, who suggested that Bernie Sanders supporters want violence against Wall Street bankers. Those are the people who are tearing the party apart. And it's actually incumbent upon them to unite the party, not us. So I refuse to lay down and give up. That's not going to happen. So here's the thing. If you're a Bernie Sanders supporter, I understand that you're demoralized. I understand that many of you will give up after today. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to continue to support Bernie Sanders. I will donate to his campaign. I will do what I can to spread the word about Bernie Sanders and help him win. Because we're progressives. We don't quit no matter what. Even if the prognosis is bad and it looks as though his prospects have diminished, I'm not going to give the establishment what they want and just give up. I'm sorry. There's going to be calls from Hillary Clinton's campaign and many in the media that Bernie Sanders should exit the race. And many people will probably be persuaded by that argument on Bernie Sanders' side, but don't do that. Don't give them what they want. You keep fighting. Even if it's the case that we have a Republican president come November, we continue to fight and push for progressive ideas. We don't give up because of the outcome of, ele of an election. The issues are bigger than this election. The issues are bigger than Bernie Sanders. So I will never stop fighting for progressive issues. And currently, the way that we can facilitate the fight for progressive issues is through Bernie Sanders. But if it's the case that Bernie Sanders loses, I don't just give up on those issues. I continue to fight for those issues. And because we're Bernie Sanders supporters, because we've overcome so much in this election, I don't think many of you will give up. I think we're going to try to persevere through this, and we're still going to try to win. So if you're Hillary Clinton, if you're Debbie Wasserman Schultz, if you're a Hillary Clinton supporter, and you're expecting us to be quiet and just support your corporatist corrupt candidate after tonight, sorry, not going to happen. We still continue to fight for Bernie Sanders no matter what. We fight to the end. We're not going anywhere. So get used to us.